Hey gang, hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah, hope you're taking it easy, having a good time, good week, all that fun stuff. So this video is going to be a fun one because we're going to be talking about a process I use quite a bit. Um, not only is kind of a quick prototyping thing, but this is actually a fun technique that I learned that can actually push me to final for client work and stuff like that too. So I'm using it more and more often. Uh, the more comfortable I'm getting with it, it's just a lifesaver. It saves a ton of time. Uh, you can kind of go crazy with your colors. Uh, and it's also a great way to learn about color theory if you're a little bit skittish and not very confident on um, being able to mix things in the color wheel. So without further ado, let's talk about my process on going from grayscale to color. All right, here we go. So this uh, painting actually took, I don't know, over two hours, almost three hours. I need to do the math. Um, or no, not almost three hours. It was only a little over two, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> all of my all of my times are mixing together. But also, I actually, uh, because, uh, you know, baby boy, um, recorded this in a few different uh, sittings. Uh, I only took like five, ten minute breaks in between to, you know, burp baby or something like that. And was able to kind of come back and stay in the same mindset, in the same problem solving mode. Which is cool. But, yeah, this one was basically a photo study that I wanted to have some slight stylization on. And then really get some stylization on the color side of things. So, this brings up the topic for this time, which is going from grayscale to color. Now, before we get too far into this, if you search for this on YouTube, you're going to see a ton of videos uh, about going from grayscale or like a value sketch to color. And we all kind of use exactly the same method. So, you know, long story short, basically you're going to have your value sketch or painting or kind of however you work in that black and white grayscale. And then you're going to just make a new layer on top of that and change the blending mode type or the layer blend to color and what that allows is for you to pick whatever color you want on the color wheel but as you paint on top of that black and white layer or your grayscale layer it will not affect the values so you're going to get the pigment let's say of a red or a blue um and, and you're going to kind of get that that hue and but the chroma is really going to be dictated by that under layer of your values. So there's that old saying that value does the work while color gets the credit. And I think that's definitely true here. But if you go see, I know there's amazing artists that talk about kind of going from uh, grayscale to color. I think the ones I can think of top of my head are going to be Marco Bucci. Um, I think Adam Duff did one, which was really good. Um... Anthony Jones, um, Ahmed Aldori, uh, really any big, <laughs> any big name YouTuber probably has a video about this. And, and like I said, everyone kind of has a similar take on it. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was one, why this is a fun thing to do, but then also how to take another step past this part, past the part of having grayscale going to color. What do you do then? What do you do to kind of finalize it? So I wanted to discuss why this is so much fun to do. So in my opinion, having your values right, whether and if we define values in this, it's how, how your shadows are versus your highlights. So your light versus dark. And what is your value range? How dark does it get? Are your blacks really black and crunchy? Um, are the whites super bright and highlighted? Or is your, is your value range a little more subdued? So a lot of art professors and stuff, and I like to think about it as a scale as well on a, on a one to 10 or a 10 point scale of, um, and usually actually a nine point scale because I want five to be in the middle. So five would be 50% gray. And then depending on what direction you go, um, I usually go by the amount of white in there. So pitch black for me would be one or zero depending on my scale. And then you would kind of go up by 10% of lightness, going from pitch black all the way to bright, you know, bloomed out white. 
and or digital white which is pure light which doesn't really exist in nature but that's neither here nor there <laughs> we'll we'll be doing a full color theory thing and kind of a digital painting color course um, that i'll be releasing hopefully in the next few months but basically the value scale you keep your value structures the same that's as that's going to be the thing that gives you your perspective and your distance and that feeling of depth and, and nice kind of form uh, you can do smooth transitions, harsh transitions between your values, and that's going to give you shape and the optical illusion of light passing through a space, even though we're working on a 2D plane. You want to introduce that kind of visual uh, niceness of 3D. You want to have that kind of a full feeling in your piece. And value is how you do that. So one of the great things about working in value is you can solve a vast majority of your problems early you can do your edge control you can get as rendered as you want as sloppy as you want you can be uh, kind of loosey-goosey with those brush strokes or you can be very refined you can make composition choices and stuff and because you're working in black and white you can quickly edit things you're not worried about well now these colors don't match and stuff like that because you're, you're strictly defining two different parts of the process. You're creating your piece and your composition first, then you're adding color later, almost as the frosting on the cake. And yeah, value value is always the way to go. That I still work this way. I will probably always work this way, unless there's a specific reason, uh, which I wouldn't, which we'll talk about near the end when I, I talk about pushing to final after doing this. So you have your value and you can see here, um, I, I kind of just looked at, you know, I looked at the source. I tried to match it fairly closely, but I'm getting to the point to where doing photo studies of exactly what I see in the photo is kind of boring. I don't like doing it as much anymore. I like getting the general shapes and then looking at some of the main ideas. So for this one, I love the look of this guy's just his demeanor, I guess you could say. Just he looked very official, but he reminded me of like a plague doctor, like a doctor that would actually be a villain in a movie. Like he starts off really cool and you, you know, oh, I relate to this guy, I relate to this character. And then as the movie goes further along or as the book goes further along, you realize that probably his, in his mind, he's right, but he's actually doing some really kind of heinous stuff. And I like that vibe. So I wanted to embrace it by making this a plague doctor. And I was like, okay, He's going to be a plague doctor. Um, and in my mind, as I'm doing this, I'm like, what colors am I going to use? In doing the, the grayscale to color, you can do whatever colors you want. It's, it's fantastic. It's so freeing to be able to just pick a color off the color wheel and put it somewhere and see if it looks good. And if it doesn't, just change it. Since you're on the color layer, you know, and it's kind of doing a color overpass type thing, you can tweak, you can edit, you can... Even on the color um, the color layer itself, what I like to do sometimes, if I don't really know kind of what theme I'm going for or what the look is, I will go online and search um, images from movies that I like. Just anything. It could be Blade Runner or like No Country for Old Men. Just I'll think of a color. I'll be like, oh, what, what's a nice kind of cool blue looking movie? And it could be something like Deep Blue Sea, or just something that has a lot of blue in it. Or, oh, let me see what the color range was on the Lord of the Rings films, or something. And then you can grab a screenshot, bring it in on a new layer, and then on that layer, make that the color overlay layer. And you're going to see how those colors intermingle with what you already have. Now, you may have to flip it, or spin it, or kind of mirror it, or do that stuff, but... Since it's a color layer, you can just color pick from that color layer and just paint on top of it. So it's a great way to get started. And it's gonna look bizarre. I know for me, I didn't use this method a whole lot starting off whenever I started digital stuff because I didn't like, it, it felt phony. It didn't feel as rich or vibrant as coloring or painting directly from color, which is true. And the reason why that is, if you're ever curious about why does the, the colors might look fine, but something still looks off, it is because, pr probably, uh, I'll preface it with a probably, there might be another thing, but 
from what I see from my experience of doing it, your brush stroke direction and the width of the brush stroke and like the brush type and stuff with your color overlay layer probably does not match what you did for your value painting. Does that make sense? So like, like here, if I were to do like his chin or, you know, kind of his cheeks, and I would do a very deliberate like cheek motion, like a kind of a rounded bevel around his cheek to kind of define that shape. Um, something that I've noticed that gets me a lot of better results is if I try to mimic that same paint brush stroke on the color layer, almost, it sounds weird, but you're almost tracing your brush strokes. If you can remember what brush you primarily used and then what directions your hand went, try to mimic that and you're gonna notice that that color overlay layer for whatever reason it starts looking better and more vibrant and more it makes more sense like your brain won't have that weird disconnect it'll still be there but it won't be as bad because now your color and your brush stroke of your value are very similar instead of like doing a brush stroke going diagonal 45 degrees you know bottom to top and then you bring in a color, almost make an X or something, like that wouldn't really work because uh, your brain's trying to process, well, how is that color m not matching the line that I'm looking at? So maybe try that. That might help um, relieve some of that weird tension that your piece might have. But that also means you can use that to your advantage. If you do want a weird sense of tension, Go ahead and make your brush strokes with your color brushes and on your color overlay layer different. Make it slightly chaotic, make it dissonant and not really harmonic and make it, I don't know, you can, you can use that to your advantage. Not everything has to be exactly quote unquote right. And that's why I love this method a lot is because you can mix colors that don't go together. Like you'll probably notice I have kind of the skin tone and it's a little too red, but then I had the green and it's almost like Christmas color green, but I sort of liked it because it was weird. So I kept it. And then I looked at my color wheel and I was like, okay, how can we make that green really stand out a little more? So we already had that red warm of the skin pigment. So I went to purple because of course on the color wheel, on a traditional color wheel, green and purple are kind of opposite. So they are complementary colors. You can use one of those colors to really pop the other one. Um, and like I said, we'll be talking about that a lot in the color uh, theory thing that I want to talk about in the course that I'm going to do. But just know that complementary colors, you really can't go wrong. Um, they're, they're that way for a reason. Your eye processes them a certain way and it's a safe bet. It's a very safe bet. So you can have your orange and yeah, you're kind of green, yellowy type stuff with your purple reds and, you know, your your pure orange with your pure blue. And, you know, you see these things and um, depending on what program and what type of color wheel you use, that can be a slight difference. So instead of having, you know, like a yellow, like a yellow, red, blue type thing, you could have a RGB, a red, green and blue. Um, which is more of the digital monitor stuff. But once again, I, I don't want to go too far over into the color theory stuff. Just know that the way that paint works is slightly different than the way digital paint works because you're using light instead of, it's an additive type of color, which means the more color you add, the brighter and more white things get. However, if you're mixing paint an actual pigment on a palette, the more color you add to each other, the darker it gets. So that's how you end up with that brown, dark reddish mud. Um, that That's basically uh, subtractive. So you're, you're subtracting color as you add more color, which is really weird. But going from one to the other is bizarre. But just knowing that rule is gonna help you in this process because you're dealing with light. You're dealing with dark versus light. And if you're, adding color on top what I normally do and you'll see it here I pick a darker pigment or or I get like a dark brown or a dark blue or a dark red you know um lower on the brightness scale but really rich color very high saturation and I put those colors in the shadows 
Um, that What that does is that gets away from having pure white highlights and pure black shadows, which automatically make things look flat. You never want to do that. Um, now, I do it from time to time. In parts, I want really high contrast. I think in the eye, I do it here. I will keep black on white. I will do his deepest shadow as a black, and then the brightest highlight right next to it as pure white, just because that's going to be your most stark like striking contrast and that's where your focal point is going to be so that's a thing you can plan out either in your in, in your value phase as you're structuring your piece or it's something you can think about as you add color um what colors do you want where's your focal point are the edges harsher here should there be a big difference in contrast whether it's you know the color wheel or going from like purple to red to blue like should it be a smoother transition that's kind of all up to you and that's what's really fun about this but what my luck usually what i have and i get the most compliments about my work is whenever i have one main mother color and mother color is a term from painting to where basically every color you put on your palette has to go through the mother color first so let's say for this one my mother color was purple every color i put on the wheel has to have a little bit of purple in it so even if it's a bright green it has to have a touch of that purple because that's your mother color it, that's the rule you have to have it so i usually get my best results and the most fun results when i have one predominant color and then bring in whether a complementary or an accent or a triadic color or something like that and really bump up that contrast um uh, andrew zorn did this super well i had that uh tutorial about making a landscape with a limited palette and I do highly recommend it. We talk quite a bit about color theory in there. But what Andrew Zorn did that I love so much is he'll use one main set color, usually that, um, oh, what does he have? He has the cadmium red light and he has the yellow ochre. So he's a big yellow ochre guy. Um, so he'll use that in diminishing versions of lightness. So dark yellow ochre, because he'll mix that, um, oh, what ivory black is the one. It's kind of a bluer black. So he'll mix that really dark, like almost like a burnt color. But then what he does is he ramps that back up and then he uses that light, that nice scarlet red, that cadmium red light to blast out some color. And it, it looks stunning, it really does. So trying that, making one main color and then using your um, contrasty color as your highlight um, or your focal point should be pretty good. Another thing is, and this is another thing about color, gray is your best friend. Gray is in every color. You, every single color that ever exists has some form of gray in it because it has to have lightness and it has to have darkness. Um, so gray is a perfect transition color. If you're going from one extreme, such as an orange, and then you're going over to a blue, and they're both pretty saturated, make sure that that space in between, um, if this is your effect you're going for, is gonna be more gray. That's where colors love to hang out, is in the grays. And uh, you can use that as well. Make all of your um, kind of tertiary colors, your, your kind of background colors more grayish and a little more muddy. Then in that focal point, really blast up that, that highlight of a high saturation high chroma um so yeah just a little a few little tips that i found that work really well for me but um okay let's talk about that finishing point so what you'll see here and i kind of i do it a little bit but normally like whenever i did work for warhammer uh this is what i did is i would get to this point i would get to the point that you're kind of seeing in the video um either right now or it's coming up close to it to where I have the colors in, I feel pretty good about it. Then what I'll do is I will merge that into its own set layer. So basically the color composition, I'll just kind of like, uh, I'll keep a copy of all of that. I'll copy merged in Photoshop. Other uh, softwares have a different version of that. Basically I want an exact copy on a new layer of what I have right there with the color. And then what I do is I grab the paint brushes that I want and then I will actually paint in color on a normal layer on top of that. So I'll use the color picker to pick colors I had already put down using this grayscale to color method. 
with a color overlay. And that's basically my underpainting. And I know it might seem a little too, like, underpainting. Like, usually whenever you hear underpainting, you think, oh, really rough, kind of like raw sienna type, you know, one color sort of thing. But really what's nice about this is this still allows me to get some rich brush strokes with color on the brush. Instead of just trying to fool the eye and thinking I did the painting in color, this will allow me to get those nice, beautiful blends of color uh, because I'll be working color into color, wet on wet sort of style. And I find this works super well because this one allows me to correct anything that I've seen that's maybe causing an issue, but also it, it allows the rest of it to kind of sing. It, it You can really put your nice, bright, brush stroke, thick paint highlight, and it's going to be the right color because you're picking the color from the canvas you already made. You know what I mean? So I that's maybe my favorite part. I like getting in color, and I like doing that on the grayscale to color method, but the biggest complaint I see from um, other professional artists or maybe even, uh, you know, newer artists just trying to learn this method, they'll say the colors don't quite look right. They just don't look right. They don't look like they fit what I've made. Now, two things. One, you're probably right. You're probably accurate. Um, but also remember, you're the one painting it, so you're in problem-solving mode. Other people won't notice as much. Do you know what I mean? But the way to remedy that exact thing is put down those colors in the color overlay on top of your values make a merged copy of that, and then paint it like you normally would with colored brushes, thick brushes, smudge tools, all that. That way, it's almost like you're coloring in the lines. So a lot of your problem solving is done. However, that allows you to also focus on maybe tightening up the render or, you know, getting those cool edges like, oh, I want these edges to be cloudy and these. That really allows you to start having fun with like mixer brush tools and treating it like you would from square one. But you can work with more confidence because not only are your values correct, but your colors are where you want them already. Um, so this really opens the floodgate. That's where you start really having fun, is that final push, because you're gonna start seeing some really cool ideas and interesting things come whenever you start blending these colors together and start using your brushes in fun ways. But that's it for me. I hope this helped out a Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions on this method. I do think I'm going to be making a real-time tutorial on this. I had a real-time tutorial about texture brush usage, and I think this kind of falls into that as well. So if you're interested in seeing a more step-by-step, real-time, let's make a painting, let's do the values, let's put the color on top, and then let's finish it, let me know. It may be a few hours long. Um, and, and it might be a premium tutorial, but it'd only be a few bucks. I think I want to, you know, keep my stuff really affordable and uh, accessible to whoever might want it. But, uh, yeah, like I said, we're going to be doing kind of a big, not a master class because I don't know Jack about color. <laughs> anyone, anyone who tells you they know anything about color theory is full of it because it's such a weird, big thing that like, oh, it's so tough, but that's why this is so cool is it allows you to start getting more comfortable using color and what works and what doesn't because the real vividness of your piece is coming from the value, not the color. Uh, so this lets you play around and work in confidence and have fun and yeah, that's what it's all about anyway. But yeah, let me know in the comments what you think. If you have any questions at all, feel free to ask them. I'm more than happy to answer and I hope you all have a fantastic week. Uh, stay safe out there and we will see you next time. Peace.